All right, welcome back, everybody. We are at week five, uh, meaning there are only two more weeks left somehow. I don't know how that really happened. Uh, a lot to cover in the next couple weeks, um, but I'm looking forward to it. I think now we're kind of crossing over into a new area of actually making stuff, which I think will be really exciting and a lot more fun than just continually processing uh, video. All right, so as a reminder, uh, we are kind of over the hump, I'll talk about that in a minute, um, of analysis tools, and now we're into actually playing with them. So this should be pretty exciting. The next couple weeks are all about sort of sequencing and editing things together and doing interesting stuff with our video data set. A couple updates. Um, I did update the PyScene to Tech Notebook. Um, it's the same one linked to from our uh, syllabus. Um, there's a couple other notes in there in Slack if anyone's interested. Uh, but the big thing is um, I found that the, the default PyScene Detect command doesn't really work that well for black and white footage. Um, so digging through some of the PyScene Detect uh, details, GitHub pages, that sort of thing, um, I found a better way to uh, work on black and white footage. So there's now like a checkbox in the notebook where if you are using black and white footage, you should check that. Uh, you'll get better cuts. I said a couple weeks ago there would be bonus content next week, uh, and there wasn't. Um, I was on vacation, and I kind of lost track of time. Um, I hope there will be bonus content this week. Uh, I just need to work on the editing of things. As always, uh, edits take the longest. Maybe I should use some of the internal tools we have already built here for that material, but we'll do that. Um, also, I said that I've been ma I will make this form, and I actually will this time, although I'm a little worried about what's going to happen with my uh, Drive account when we, blow it, when we add all these videos in here, but um, I'll set it up this week, and we'll see what happens. Um, I don't know. This could be really cool and fun, or it could be like a mess of data. Um, only time will tell, I guess, so we'll find out. I want to start with some inspiration for the week. Um, uh, someone in Slack, I'm sorry, I totally forgot who posted it, uh, but they posted one of Christian Markley's work, so I'll talk about both of, a couple pieces of his. Um, Christian Markley is an artist who I would say like falls under the camp uh, category of use, being a sampling artist. Like, he does a lot with audio and records and uh, sampling audio, but for maybe the past 20, 25 years, he's also worked a lot with video. Um, this is one of his pieces called Made to be Destroyed. Um, and it's literally uh, a series of clips from movies, both famous and not famous, where people destroy artwork. Um, and I think it's kind of a fascinating uh, experience. Um, obviously something that we could talk about in this class, like very close to what we try to do in this class of categorizing things. What I like here, though, is that like this is actually kind of a hard thing to categorize using machine learning. It's really kind of a unique um, sort of thing. I guess maybe you could create a data set of people wiping away stuff, but even that doesn't cover some of the material that people are destroying in these pieces. So it's really interesting to see uh, sort of a unique categorization. Um, and I think obviously it has uh, connotations about what it means to cut out parts of video, put it together, um, probably a lot to do with how people sometimes perceive sampling. Uh, Christian Markley is probably one of his most famous work and the work that was posted in our Slack channel was a film called The Clock. Um, and I'm sorry for the quality of this video clip. Uh, the Clock is actually a 24-hour video piece um, where supposedly uh, he and six art assistants took him about three, out, three years, three hours, three years to uh, create this 24-hour looping film. Um, and what it is is as you go through all the pieces, they found um, any scene with a clock in it um, and then you know resequenced it. It's also sequenced, I believe, based on the time. So if you are literally viewing it at noon, um, in the in a gallery, you will actually see pieces related to noon. So this, I think, was posted around three o'clock, is what I've read. Um, so you'll see that the 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 clocks on the walls here say are about three o'clock. Um, what I also think is interesting is not purely just like, hey, let's look at a clock, um, but it's also about you know different uh, characters are talking about, oh, they're going to be late for something, they had an appointment at this hour. So again, it's kind of harder to do than you know, we could do with even machine learning. Um, you know, one of the things that we talked about in this was like, well, this took them three years. How long would it take them today with sort of the tools we have now? And maybe three months, but it's actually still, you know, you could go through and just find clocks, um, but then you need to go in and figure out what time it is. And maybe you could do that uh, using, again, another machine learning tool or other things. But then there's even these other moments where like, clearly this is across a cut. Like, you know, our tools are not necessarily set up like that. Uh, you're seeing other pieces of, of the film here. So some really interesting aspects, and again, uh, probably a challenge even today to make this stuff. But what I, what I kind of uh, happened before the technology is even available, and then we like get the technology to actually start doing it. So it's sort of like, you know, technology is catching up with culture rather than the reverse. 
Um, I don't know if I mentioned this, but uh, I had to re-record this session. Um, for every reason, I wasn't recording with the audio on. Uh, but I'm really happy that I had to re-record this because I forgot to include this the first time I talked about it. So this is a piece by Craig Baldwin. Um, if you've never seen any Craig Baldwin's work, highly, highly, highly recommend checking this out. Uh, he is a really crazy artist, um, but all I believe most of his work uses found footage. Uh, this is a piece called Tribulation 99, Alien Anomalies Under America. Um, I highly, You have to watch this piece. It's unreal. It's unlike anything I've seen before. Uh, you can imagine this as almost being like, I don't know, the X-Files, but through found footage and like an even crazier conspiracy theory. Uh, it's basically like a, a film with a fake conspiracy theory sort of outline, and then it uses clips from all sorts of found footage uh, to make the case for this conspiracy theory or like to tell this narrative. Um, clearly it's still very prescient 25 years later, uh, but it's really, really cool. Um, definitely recommend checking this one out, and it is wild and unlike anything you've ever seen before so uh definitely check that one out um and then in a similar vein is this piece called fraud by dean fleischer camp um man this one's hard to describe but uh this is so the dean fleischer camp found this material of like i think 100 hours of youtube videos from this family um you know the the dad was just like recording everything and uploading it to youtube uh, and he found this material and he started to edit it together into a story that uh, I don't want to spoil it. It takes it out of context of what is actually happening in the material, but he found ways to sort of do some deceptive editing as well as adding additional clips to tell a very like interesting uh, story. Um, as I understand, this has caused a lot of controversy when it when this shows at various documentary uh, film festivals for a lot of the reasons we talked about in week one, right? Which is like taking from a family that's randomly posting stuff on YouTube. Like, what is what are the ethical implications of that? Um, and it raised a lot of concerns as this was presented as sort of a faux documentary. It definitely has like a found footage, almost horror style feel to it, but it isn't. It's just very fascinating. Um, but again, I love that this used material just found off YouTube. Um, and it's edited the entry for this uh, before I start talking about this. And apparently the director uh, was kind of hesitant to actually work on this project because he was so worried about how much editing it would take. Uh, and again, I think that is... A constant theme of maybe parts of this class right which is like can we use technology today to edit things in a way that we see interesting or we can save ourselves some time but also do really uh difficult and tricky editing projects with with these kind of tools um i think the thing i love about both this and the craig baldwin piece is that a thing we're looking at this week is creating narratives and both these pieces create narratives that do not exist in the original film structure right so they are creating new narratives but using material that they found. And I think, again, that's like a very interesting use case for the tools that we are building up throughout this class. Uh, I also wanted to find um, a piece that uses Exquisite Corpse. So this is a piece from Sapphire Goss called Interior. Uh, this was done during the COVID lockdown of 2020. Um, Sapphire Goss is like a, a well-known filmmaker. Um, and what they did is they uh, you know, if you're unfamiliar with Exquisite Corpse, it was a surrealist tool, um, have been used by many, many artists. What you do is you record a certain piece, in this case, you record a certain piece and share that one piece with an artist. That artist then takes inspiration from that piece, creates their own piece, and then what you do is you share that clip and only that clip with the next artist. So basically you get this sort of like continually changing narrative based on only the previous piece that was seen. So in the surrealist world, it was used a lot for like surrealist poetry. Uh, for drawings, um, that sort of thing. I think, again, it's an interesting conceptual way to generate a narrative, which is what we're going to look, look at this week. Um, and, you know, generate a narrative that is sort of poetic and abstract, but has some relation to what we see or what we're working, the materials we're working with. Unless you think I only show artistic work here, um, I don't know if anyone else has been getting this for the past like couple weeks. I've been getting this McDonald's ad on my YouTube channel. And it's only uh, clips from famous movies or not famous movies that feature McDonald's. Uh, and it feels so prescient that I'm seeing this ad right at this exact moment that I'm teaching this class. Uh, it's very confusing that it is happening to me right now. I felt like I was sort of being tricked or like someone was, I don't know, maybe someone at McDonald's is actually uh, watching our videos and uh, created this alongside of it. But of, of films uh, going from very mainstream to what I would say is not very mainstream. Um, so really fascinating. And again, maybe there's commercial potential with these tools. I kind of doubt it. Like this feels like a one-off 
uh, sort of thing. But it is uh, nevertheless a way to uh, look at this. And I think you know what's interesting here is they're clearly looking for dialogue. And I don't know, maybe there's someone at McDonald's that is known, you know, or like legal contracts have said whenever McDonald's gets mentioned that they keep track of that. Um, and then someone went back and found all the clips. Really cool, fascinating stuff and uh, kind of interesting for McDonald's. I don't know, maybe a little too corporate, but interesting nonetheless. Okay, so I mentioned two weeks ago that we were going to stop using analysis tools, uh, but actually I've got one more for us. Um, I was talking to my friend Lucas and sort of explaining what the class was about, and they were like, well, you're going to let people like create dialogues and then clip everything together, right, to tell us, to tell that narrative, right? And I was like, oh shit, I hadn't really thought about dialogue. Like, I, I obviously should have, but I hadn't really covered it yet. So we're going to use a tool that uh, allows us to extract dialogue from um, the audio of our clips. Um, so we use this tool from OpenAI, it's called Whisper, um, and it converts audio from our clips to text. So we'll cover that in uh, one of our tutorials this week. Um, a couple notes about this one is I think it works fairly well. It's not perfect, but it works pretty well. Um, obviously when it gets to names, it's like any um, transcription, like if you've ever used an automated transcription tool like YouTube's or whatever, um, you'll know it messes up certain words because it's like not in its dictionary or it messes up people's names because it doesn't really understand how names work, that sort of thing. Um, but it does work pretty well, which is going to be helpful for us. Uh, the cool thing is there's also a bunch of different models. Um, there is There are models that are meant to be fast, like, you know, working at, like, you know, 10x the speed of the video clip. Um, but then there are also ones that are more accurate. Uh, and again, this is sort of a, we've seen this with other uh, machine learning tools. And in this class, like, you can go for fast, which is always nice if you have a lot of data. Or you can go with accurate. And in general, I always lean toward accurate because I only want to do this once and I want it to be good. Um, and with a lot of these models, accurate means like 80, 90% correct, not 100. And less accurate means like 75, 70%. So I always lean toward accurate, but you can do what you're interested in. Uh, the cool thing is if you are not working in English with English audio, this does support multiple languages. Um, I'll cover how to do that in the tutorial. A couple downsides with these tools. Uh, like any journal model, this one hallucinates. And by that, I mean it makes shit up. Uh, it will make up phrases, especially when there's no when there's no discernible language. It tends to find stuff that's in there. Um, there's this one hallucinates in very weird ways. I'll point this out when we actually do the tutorial, um, in a way that I think you can kind of track, but it's still kind of confusing why it even does that. Uh, but anyway, it does hallucinate. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that you know often dialogue runs across multiple clips, right? So someone would be talking over something, but between there, there's a bunch of different scenes. So Kind of the challenge here is like our clips might have a little section dialogue what we really want is the whole section a little bit hard to work with but in this case we do get some like in this clip there is this text being said and i think we can at least work off that so we will we will look at that uh today and then that will lead into the part of this class which is going to be using um dialogue and or the descriptions we made in week three week four i forget exactly when um so we're going to do uh some tooling where we basically ask for a clip kind of almost like text prompting where we say like I want something like this and then it returns back based on the descriptions that we've already tagged our data uh, that the clips of those you know uh, suggested uh, prompts so it works in this way called text embeddings um, so we're going to use a process called sentence similarity but that depends on this concept of text embeddings so I'll be honest text embeddings and you know natural language processing is not my uh, strong suit so I'm going to kind of describe this, but it'll be a little wishy-washy because, again, not my area of expertise, but I think it'll at least help explain a little bit about what these models are doing, just so you're aware. Um, so with text models, the idea here is, like with any machine learning model, you need data, right? So um, the people who make these models go out, scrape Wikipedia, scrape the entire internet in many cases, which is obviously going to lead to ethical issues, but um, in general, scrape a bunch of data. You get then a bunch of words, phrases, sentences, etc. And then you feed it to the machine learning model and you say, like, make a representation of language in this model. So in this case, I've got a bunch of words here, man, hat, child, cat, bicycle, car, woman. As the model trains over time, what you end up with is these clusters, right? So we've got a cluster of, I don't know, human words, right? Man, child, woman. Um, we get a maybe a cluster of animal, you know, mammals. Uh, then we get a cluster of objects, but maybe hat is closer to people because people are hats or people drive, drive, ride bicycles, uh, but then cars are like the least human, I don't know, I'm making this up. Uh, so you get these different clusters, right? And this is really important because this then provides what is essentially a representation 
in math, in a mathematical space, right? And that's the key if you've seen my classes on latent spaces for style gam models or other things, like having some mathematical model with coordinates essentially is really important. And I should also mention, um, you're seeing this in a two-dimensional space, but like all these machine learning models, they're like very, very high dimensional. We're talking about like, you know, thousands of different dimensions, which we can't really visualize. So we do it in 2D just for our own sanity. Um, but the idea is that there's these highly dimensional representations of things being close and far away from each other. Um, and that leads us to do things like uh, make associations or find words that are close to each other and make comparison there. Um, so the really common one uh, that you'll often see people make is that these models should be able to make analogies, right? So if I say uh, a man is to a king as a woman is to, and you ask the model, it should say queen. And what you can kind of see here, the idea here is that the distance as well as the movement uh, directionally between man and king and woman and queen should be pretty much the same. Like it should, you know, in this high dimensional coordinate space, move the same on a direction to make these two representations together. Uh, and likewise, it could do something like you could say, a uh, boy is the prince or a girl is the princess, like that sort of thing. Um, sorry, I know gender is not an ideal state for here, but this is kind of the analogy everyone uses. Um, regardless, like this is sort of the idea is that because of this, you can start to make uh, good guesses and associations between different words or phrases or sentences. Uh, similarly, which we will probably see in this, is let's say that I um, ask something for like, show me a teal ocean. Um, well, the model will understand that like, teal is close to blue and green, but far away from yellow. So it will also find similarly closely connected ideas of blue ocean or green ocean and not find red oceans. I mean, red oceans don't really exist, maybe on Mars or whatever, but like, in general, it's also going to find, you know, what we would describe as fuzzy matching. This is not like, it's only going to find representations of teal matching. It's going to say like, hey, um, there's also these other things that are kind of closely related, not as close, but like close enough. Like, here's some other things you might want to look at. And for what we're going to do in, in this class, uh, this week especially, that's really important. So the really important thing here is I showed a lot of stuff based on words. But these also work on phrases and sentences and paragraphs and documents. Um, they're now very, very large, very powerful tools, right? You've probably used chat, GPT, or other things. Um, these models are now massive and do really kind of amazing things that we kind of consider magic, but they're not really. They're just all relating on these really high dimensional uh, text embedding spaces. Um, but the important thing for us is that the ability to match without using explicit word matches is really powerful, right? It means we can ask for something like um, a guy in a room by himself at a desk, and we might get something back where the text description says, you know, a man in a suit sits in a room. Like, and those are not one-to-one -one matches, but they're fairly close to each other. So the model will tell us, using this thing called sentence similarity, it'll tell us like, hey, these are close to each other, and here's a the approximation of the score of closeness. Um, so when we do this, and we'll look at this in the tutorial, we'll find that. Um, our sentence similarity score can range from 1.0 to 0, 0. Um, and 1.0 means it is, it is an exact match, meaning it is the exact same words in the exact same order um, and no extraneous words. Less than that would be like what I described, which is like a match, but it's more of a fuzzy match, right? It finds similar words, but also finds similar phrases and that sort of thing. And it's, you know, related to each other conceptually, I guess. Um, obviously, as you get lower and lower and lower down the scoring, it is further and further away. Um, that could either mean it's the exact opposite phrase, or it could mean that it is a very, very different phrase. Um, but what this allows us to do, again, is sort of that text prompting where actually we can search for video. And this is actually what a lot of searching tools are now based on, or video search, you know, uh, you might see some more like fancy sort of video searching tools um, on like stock video sites, that sort of thing. Um, so these are able to associate video content to each other. Um, and that's going to be really huge for us because now we're going to be able to sequence things and find the closest matching video in our data set and then show that in that place without having to do like full on matching or like go through tags and a bunch of other stuff. It's very powerful because it's kind of like fuzzy and not an exact one to one match. Uh, so a couple warnings about using sentence similarity because we're definitely going to see this happen in this class. So I'm actually going to start with a second data point here, which is that like with pose detection last week, uh, the more data you have, the more likely you are to get good matches. Um, and this is because, you know, if you're looking for something like, you know, a purple sky with a dancing cat in front of it, 
uh, the likelihood of you having that in a, I don't know, normal film data set is going to be pretty rare. Um, however, maybe there's a dancing cat in something like Milo and Otis, but no purple background. So, you know, again, uh, the more data you have, the more likely you are to get full matches. Uh, the other thing I would mention is that if you looked closely at the descriptions being generated by stuff like Blip2 or Mplug Al or even Whisper, which we're going to use this week, um, you'll notice that they kind of have a style to them or a tone to them. Um, Blip2 tends to be a little bit more descriptive and Mplug Al tends to be very much like in this video, in this scene, in this image, you see X, Y, and Z. Um, so they tend to be a little bit more flat. Uh, in general, when we do sentence similarity, the more likely we can match that sort of tone or style, the better our matches are going to be. Um, and that's kind of a challenge because uh, we, if we use a tool like ChatGPT, it doesn't necessarily know to like write in the style of Mplug Owl descriptions. So we may have to feed it some examples and actually see if it can you know match to that. Um, so it's a little bit of a challenge to do that, but I think we can get close enough to it uh, in order to do what we want to do. So obviously we're talking about we're going to generate some text or we're going to create some text and then we're going to match that to our videos. And you may be thinking like, well, how do I go about generating text? Well, obviously there's a couple different techniques. Some we've already talked about, but you know, you could just write your own. Um, let's say you've got a plan for a script for a movie and you want to do pre-production and use a bunch of clips from famous films or whatever. You could write it yourself uh, and just write it out and we'll look at how to do that or how to ingest that essentially to use it as a data set. Um, you can use existing content. So poetry, I know there are a lot of sites that, that post um, scripts from famous movies. So you compare it to the original output or just read the script itself. Um, that's certainly possible and we could look at that. I won't really cover how to like ingest full documents, but for now, let's just assume you can like cut and paste or pull stuff into like the preview in Apple and Max and like you can copy even scan text now using OCR or whatever. So um, something to be done there. Uh, the other thing we'll look at in this week's tutorial is actually taking our existing text from our data set and then doing like the, I don't know, refrigerator poetry magnet of like swapping stuff around, right? So um, we've already generated a ton of data using uh, mplug, blip2, or uh, this week's dialogue extraction from Whisper. We could then output all that and then just rearrange things in the order we want. Now that's going to lead to like a, an obvious one-to-one -one matching and that'll be helpful for us. Um, but it also gives us a little bit more of like a, a constraint to play with, which will be helpful. Um, we will look at a little bit of chat GPT this week. I'm not like a chat GPT expert, but we'll look at some ways to actually take some of our data, rearrange it, or ask chat GPT to just generate some stuff. And then we'll bring that back into our model to do the sentence similarity stuff. Uh, there's more creative ex like opportunities like exquisite corpse, like I just mentioned, where you could write something and have friends or family write a sentence based on that, and then you go over and over again, which could be kind of fun. Um, this is not a natural language processing class, so like I'm gonna kind of quickly go over some of this stuff because all we really want are the text. Uh, but there's a lot of good material out there to like write good poetry or do other things. Um, so if you're interested in that, definitely Google away and find cool stuff. Um, we started doing this some of this last week, uh, but another common thing that I find it works well in my practice is using what's called what I would call a guidance video. Um, so one thing we'll look at this week is we'll actually generate um, separately from our main data set. Uh, we'll set we'll pull aside one video and we'll run all the same stuff over it. Right, so we'll do FF probe, we'll do uh, you know shot detection, um, classifiers, descriptors, that sort of thing, and we will save that to a separate JSON file. And then we can read that JSON file in, read in all the descriptions, and then say, find something that matches this description. So maybe, again, you could even go out and shoot like a very rough video, have the model describe everything for you, and then have that match to your original, like to your data set. Um, really cool opportunities here. Um, I really like working with guidance videos because it kind of eliminates some of the uh, more creative side of things or just like creates some constraints for you. So um, the the important thing here is that this video cannot ex already exist in your data set. Um, or if it does, we have to go and clean it out or scrape it out or whatever. Um, because if you have your guidance video in both your guidance data set and your original data set, uh, it's just going to find the same clips again, which will kind of ruin the purpose of this. Uh, so make sure that you are either adding a new video or pulling your old data out of yours. And you can do that using that JSON editing tool or whatever on that web page. You can just go and find the videos and like pull them out and delete them and then resave that file out. Okay, so not a lot of tutorials this week. Um, 
hopefully this goes by pretty quickly and then you can just spend the week really playing. So we will look at how to do the, the dialogue extraction using Whisper. We'll then look at how to sort of write a script and then have the video uh, matching sentence similarity tool find our clips that match that script. And then lastly, we'll look at doing the video to video guidance. So we'll create that guidance video and then uh, pull all the data out of there and then compare that to our, um, our data set. And homework is really just to get down to playing. I mean, this is the first week where I think we've sort of like moved beyond that, like just process these clips over and over and over again into like now it's a place to play. And the nice thing is these tools are fairly fast. I mean, I'm not going to say they're like real time or anything, but they're fairly fast, meaning you can iterate on stuff very easily. And I think that's sort of the fun thing about this is being able to iterate, play, see what works, see what doesn't, and really find interesting opportunities. So again, I really hope this week that you uh, utilize our Slack channel um, and share cool work. In addition to sharing the clips, I would love if people also share it sort of like, here's the text that I fed into this like model to find these pieces, or here's my process for generating text. I think lots of people would love to see sort of the ex inspiration for that. I also think these things almost feel better when you can see how they were made, because it's kind of fun to see how it matches up different, different uh, pieces of text to different videos. All right, that's it for this week. Um, let's go ahead and jump into our first tutorial. So I'll see you there.